Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Okay, so I, I see that we have a, um, so the time is 7.03, so I'm going to call the meeting to order, and I see that we do have a quorum, and um, don't we, do we have a quorum? Yes, we have a quorum. So um, before we begin the meeting, I would like to ask the town manager to announce the protocols. I think I'm going to. Okay, okay, so Matt, so Matt nothing here because I'm uh, having some unstable, I'm having some unstable internet. So um, I'm going to try to log in with my phone and see if that works better. Okay. Let's, let's hold for a minute then. Um. Well. Okay, I'll I'll try now. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, uh, as you may have heard, the meeting tonight will be recorded. Um, ask that folks that have any questions or wish to make a comment, please raise your hands or um, feel free to also send me a message in the chat. Um, I see that there's a couple of residents that have already done so, so um, I will acknowledge you in just a moment. Um, if for some reason tonight we get interrupted in a way that doesn't allow us to continue on with the meeting, uh, we will um, shut off the recording, disseminate uh, a new link to join and try to take back up our business so that we can carry on and um, finish out the agenda. Um, Ask the folks that are speaking, please just make sure to uh, state your name for the record and uh, um, if you are not actively engaged in the conversation, if you could please um, be uh, better targeted for uh, the people that are active in the conversation. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I will turn it back over to you. So I think there are a few people that need to um, block their video. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so good, now we have, so we've gotten a little rusty on our Zoom since we got, <laughs> went back to reality. So thank you everybody for, um, for um okay hold on a second uh so our first um item of business is our public comment period and i see that rohi canna has um raised his hand first recording, recording. In progress. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I have uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, raise uh, this evening. Um, one relates to the question of uh, sidewalks. Uh, and I sent uh, a message to the council uh, mayor and to the town manager. Um, sort of making two very specific requests um, on the sidewalks. Um, the first is whether the town could send a polite reminder to 
individual homeowners um, where their vegetation is encroaching on the sidewalks. Um, I think, uh, you know, Matt has been sending general messages, but I think uh, uh, sort of a targeted one to individual homeowners who are, whose, whose vegetation is encroaching would be, I think, helpful. I think most uh, residents would respond quite po positively to a gentle nudge. So does, I'm, not, I'm not asking for a citation or a warning, but just a gentle nudge. Uh, and I'm assuming that uh, um, you already know quite a few of these uh, properties because I think the, the town council had a working session discussion on it. Related to this point, um, I also wanted to ask for the town itself to trim its own trees. Uh, and there are very, very large number of town trees whose branches are obstructing sidewalks. I've actually identified almost all of them for, uh, for the town manager. Um, I'm not asking for entire limbs to be cut off, but <laughs> frankly, just, you know, even if it's six to 12 inches uh, and sometimes even less of these branches, I think would be very helpful and would clear up. And I think before the town asks individual homeowners to clean up their vegetation, the town should, should do this as well. Um, and frankly, I think, you know, both of these should be fairly straightforward uh, asks. Um, the second uh, point I wanted to raise um, relates to the uh, police officer uh, contracted by the town. I know there's a lot of discussion about terms of reference and mandate and reporting and logging and guidelines and policies and so on. Um, I'm not getting involved in that discussion. I'm asking for a very common sense uh, uh, step, and that is to request the, the police officer uh, whenever, whenever he is on duty in the town to uh, station himself uh, on Dorset um, at, the, at the intersections of, of Warwick or, and or Surrey. I mean, we all know that Dorset is the busiest street in the town. Uh, and I think it's just common sense to ask him to, to station himself there. I really don't see the point of taxpayer money being spent on the police officer being at the intersection of Essex and Surrey, Falstone uh, and Surrey, Greystone. I mean, these are all really, I, I, just, I just don't understand why he would be there. Uh, and so even while we are discussing the, you know, the, the bigger issues re regarding the police with the Public Safety Committee, I think this is, a, this is a, just a common sense request, is just park yourself where there's the most traffic. Uh, I think just the visible presence of the police car there would be enough to avoid the most egregious um, violators. Again, I, I don't care if they, you know, how much they're stopping stop sign violations but there are people who are just not even yielding to pedestrians. There are people who don't even slow down at stop signs. I think just the visible presence of the police officer will address that. So, and then related to, and, and secondarily, I think that when schools, when school is in session three weeks from today, uh, I, would, I would suggest that the police officer uh, during school hours, if he is on duty at that time, should station himself uh, on Warwick near the school uh, as I think as a matter of, uh, as a matter of, again, common sense, public safety. Uh, he doesn't need to get involved in helping the crossing guard and all of that stuff. I think just, if he's going to be parked in his cruiser somewhere during school hours, park yourself near the school um, rather than park yourself on Greystone, uh, which is, I think, rather pointless. So with that, I'll, uh, I want to thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rowe for joining us tonight. I, I had meant to respond to your beautiful, comprehensive email that you wrote about 10 days ago. And uh, I am gonna let the town manager briefly respond to a couple of the topics. Um, it's very timely that you ask the questions because I believe that committees and the staff are working on um, everything that you talked about. Um, but I do wanna say that there was more good stuff in your letter that some of which um, can be addressed at the committee level too. So um, rather than take a lot of time to respond, because I'm but let me let me just have Matt briefly respond to your two biggest questions 
and then we will get back to you with answers to some of the other things you asked about in your letter. Thank you, Matt. Why don't you? Uh, and Matt has muted himself because yeah, of. Yeah, uh, apologies. Uh, I, I turned off my video just to get my connection a little bit more stable. So uh, apologies for uh, not having my video on. But uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Kana, for your uh, comments and your email. Um, with regards to the vegetation, uh, short answer is yes. Um, we, we kind of worked out a, a, a general plan based on the uh, Parks and Natural Resources Committee's uh, recommendations. And so um, the first step in that was to send out, as you said, just more generic townwide uh, reminders to folks. Thank you for sending um, a list of some addresses that, that we should put, put some eyes on. Um, I also uh, went around town and put together my own list. So uh, yeah, the next the next step is in addition to the town, I've talked to the town arborist about um, cutting back some of our own vegetation um, would be to uh, reach out to individual homeowners. And then in terms of the police, um, again, I thank you for your suggestions. Um, I think one of the things that we talked about at previous meetings was uh, perhaps to get uh, some updates from our uh, police officers at uh, periodic meetings so that they can um, sort of give give some updates on um, what they've observed over the past few months and um, any any other pertinent information that might be shared with the town and and the council. And I think that that might be a helpful step in um, improving overall the coverage in town and um, what what our expectations are and what the service we get from that. So in general, thank you very much. Appreciate the comments. Um, and as the mayor said, we can get back to you on more comprehensive response if you'd like. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Time Manager. And Rowita, I'm gonna try to give you a call. To because you had a lot of other good points in your letter that um, can be addressed. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there anyone else, any other resident or guest wish to make a public comment? Yes, uh, Julie Greenberg, I think, is okay. with us, and she uh, said that she'd like to make a comment. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, uh, this is Julie Greenberg at 4717 Fallstone. Um, but I'm here actually um, speaking on behalf of Norm Coleman, who was unable to make it on short notice today. Um, I'm just um, putting a placeholder in discussion on behalf of Mr. Coleman that um, he would like to present to the town his um, distress about the confluence of just a combination of natural circumstances as well as man-made uh, circumstances that have led to the second episode of catastrophic flooding in his um, garage and and um, and driveway area, you know, multiple feet of water. He's lost his third car, I believe. He had lost two before. Um, it's just an incredible quantity. And this one was occasioned primarily by the storm sewer breakage on Dorset. So um, given the work that the town council is hoping to do with Bayland on some of the green infrastructure that's possible in that area, but also, uh, this the, the issue has now been raised of other grading and, and sewer problems. Um, he just wanted to ask that I let you know that um, this he, he, he will be presenting you with more information and asking for technical support from the town to because he, it's just an amazingly complex problem. So thank you. And I just wanted to do that on his behalf. Yes, that, thank you, Julie. As, as you know, those are my next door neighbors. And as you know, I've lived through their three different tragedies in the last 20 years. 
And um, and I've been talking to them a lot. And also, uh, she told me she was going to come tonight. I guess she had an issue. But in any case, um, one other thing that we need to do is also have some talks with WSSC about you know the generic general problem about water main breaks and what they what kind of potential special attention they could give to the town. So so thank you for um, joining us tonight, and I will get back to uh, Norman Carroll and tomorrow again and and see what we can do to help them. But thank you. Was there anybody else, Mr. Town Manager? No other comments at this time. Okay, thank you, everybody. The next item is uh, approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. I see Councilmember Barr and seconded by the <laughs> Council President. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? All those cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, we will now move to uh, our first public hearing, uh, which is uh, to consider approval of a building permit application submitted by Peter Lustig on behalf of Lustig Associates for the construction of a new home on the property located at 5528 Trent Street. So we will begin. Today is August 7, 2023. This is a continuation of the hearing before the Town of Somerset Council to consider approval of a building permit application submitted by Peter Lustig on behalf of Lustig Associates LLC for the construction of a new home on the property located at 5528 Trent Street. As a reminder to all participants and observers, this hearing is being audio recorded. We ask that all speakers speak one at a time, addressing the council from the podium and by speaking into the microphone and state their name and address for the record before making public comment. The hearing will observe the following order. First, the Somerset Town staff will present their findings and submit for the record a report on the application under consideration. Next, the applicant will present their application. Following that, the town council will have the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant or staff relevant to the application at hand. After that, other interested parties will have the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant or present comments to the council. Following that, the applicant will have the opportunity for rebuttal testimony, after which the public comment period of the hearing shall be completed and the record closed. Finally, the council will deliberate and discuss among themselves the merits of the case, the findings of fact and conclusions, and may make a motion on a permit decision. We now begin this hearing with the presentation of the staff findings and reports. Mr. Town Manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the mayor stated, uh, just for a reminder for the council, the applicant and anybody else, uh, that this is a continuation of the hearing, which uh, began at the July 10th council meeting and at that meeting Shannon uh, paraphrasing but uh, in general came away with kind of four main points that they that they asked the applicant to address further number one was stormwater management um, generally and also specifically uh, the extent to which uh, the proposed stormwater management uh, adhered to the town's uh, tiered preference list in the code, which prioritizes environmental site de uh, design standards uh, as they're defined in the town code. The second was the driveway. The proposed driveway is seven inch incline and the town code requires all driveways to be constructed with permeable pavers except those above a five percent grade and so the council had asked the applicant to uh, consider a redesign of the driveway um, or further explanation why it was not possible to uh, bring it within a grade uh, to be able to use those perme permeable pavers 
Another concern that was brought up during the hearing was that uh, the age of the house, uh, what type of testing might be done and how de any demolition would handle hazardous materials, um, asbestos in particular was, was mentioned at the last hearing. And then there was uh, a few questions related to some discrepancies between the intake of the stormwater devices and the required amount per the per the code. Um, I, I laid out uh, kind of cover memo for the council um, that the applicant had addressed uh, all four of these questions via email. Um, number one was uh, a, 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 a a breakdown uh, um, containing an explanation that supports the, the design types that were selected and the reasons that the applicant did not, not select the preceding design types. Um, similarly, related to, to the dry, uh, driveway, the applicant stated that due to the length of the driveway and because it's flanked by dry wells uh, that are part of the uh, proposed stormwater management infiltration uh, strategy. In order to capture enough water for a one-year storm event, it wasn't practical to redesign the house and driveway with the slope under that 5%. Uh, the applicant also did um, acknowledge the concerns about asbestos and um, stated that they would, they would test, uh, take samples tests for asbestos and handle them in accordance with federal, state, and county regulations if, if, they were if it was found. Um, and then on number four, they clarified that although the individual dry wells, uh, I think two of the four individual dry wells are designed to store one cubic foot less than a one-year storm, that the total volume of water stored via the devices is beyond the one-year requirement, and so it satisfies the code requirements. Um, so given, given those explanations, the staff's opinion was that the stormwater designs do fit the criteria of the code um, and uh, recommend approval of the uh, application. Um, I, I do know we have our stormwater consultant here, Chris, Chris Stepp from Bayland, as well as our building uh, administrator, Doug Lohmeyer, and our town arborist, uh, Dr. Feather, as well, if there are any uh, follow-up questions for any of our technical experts. But but none of them, but none of them um, find, have anything, <laughs> none of them have anything to add to the um, staff report at this time. Well, I, I don't. I guess I'll give a quick opportunity. I don't know, Chris, if if you want to expound on anything I said related to stormwater, since those were those were kind of the main concerns. No, not really. I think Matt, you did a great job summing everything up and uh, summing up what the the applicant's response is to the council's concerns. Great, thank you. So, yes, I I think that concludes the staff report for this time. But happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We will now have the applicants um, either opening statement or comments on the staff report. And could the applicants please identify themselves again for the record? Uh, Mr. Lustig, and then I know that he's also joined by uh, Jeff Robertson from CAS Engineering. Uh, <clears throat> this is Peter Lustig. I am I am here. Welcome. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to your application or comment on the staff report, or you just want to take questions? Well, I, I, I um, with respect to the stormwater management uh, issues, um, I I defer to my uh, um, civil engineer Jeff Robertson from CAS Engineering, who who has um, uh, developed the plan. Um, this is not my uh, area of expertise. Um, and that is why he is uh, representing me. Um, so I would, any questions um, that need to be directed um, 
uh, about the stormwater management, I would <clears throat> I would ask Jeff to to respond um, with respect to uh, the asbestos. Um, uh, I I will have um, samples done on um, the, the the roofing material as well as various materials uh, on the inside of the house that may contain um, asbestos and um, have them tested in the lab and take any um, mediation efforts, the uh, remediation efforts that, uh, that are required um, as reported by the lab before uh, any, any uh, demolition uh, commences. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Robertson, did you wanna add anything or you just, or you you'll just take questions. Sure, uh, Jeff Robertson with Cass Engineering. Uh, nice to see everyone here uh, virtually and uh, keep me off the roads this evening. So I appreciate that. Um, no, I think uh, Matt did a good job. Um, we've been in communication regarding this plan, you know, over the last last couple of months. Hopefully you'll find that those, uh, those comments were adequately addressed and uh, look forward to answering any questions uh, anyone may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Council President Circa, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes. Um, and I guess to, to lead off the discussion, I forwarded some photographs I took um, on July 29th during that sort of micro storm that we had that I asked um, that if, if Matt, if you can uh, present uh, for for other council members and for uh, our guests. So anyhow, we were hit by that uh, storm, I believe it was Friday night, uh, the 29th, no, Saturday night, sorry. Um, felt like a tremendous amount of rainfall. It actually wasn't that much rain, it just came down really hard, really fast. It was about half an inch, I believe a little less than half an inch when I tried to look it up on uh, weather maps, but it, it was sufficient to cause a river flowing down Trent Street. And you, like I said, the rain didn't last very long. So by the time I walked up to 5528, the rain had stopped. But in the bottom picture, you can see the storm water just flowing off the property. So I just, the, the point in sharing this is um, to highlight the issue that the town is facing with stormwater and uh, the really pressing needs for stormwater management. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I do have a number of questions. I'm trying to understand, um, I guess, th the responses to um, to the council's uh, questions. Um, but I'm also trying to understand some of the engineering and calculations, um, and I'm not that familiar with all of it. So we talk about the amount of stormwater that is captured and retained by the dry wells, um, I believe I saw that there was a factor applied that effectively reduced the amount of uh, water from the roof that had to be held or stored in the dry wells. Is that correct? I guess this would be for Cass Engineering. Sorry, just working through the unmute button. Um... I'm not sure what you mean by a reduction factor applied. If, if we were to multiply the square footage of the roof by the 2.6 inch annual storm event, one year storm event, we would have a certain number of cubic feet of water to be held on site. But when I looked at the one of the tables um, in the documentation provided, um, it, it appeared that there was a factor applied that reduced the amount of water that had to be held. And I'm trying to understand why. Am I incorrect? Is there no factor you're, you're, you're holding so all the, the water? Yeah, so sheet two of the approved um, Montgomery County plans contains a table. Mm -hmm. and, that and that table is Montgomery County's Cass's formula for environmental site design. Um, 
and the county requires that 1.8 inches of runoff uh, be provided for the project. So while some devices can be sized for the one year storm, the requirement at the Montgomery County level is to, is to address 1.8 inches rather than 2.6 inches. However, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna ask, so where do you provide the calculations for 2.6 inches? Under the maximum volume check one year storm column. Um, in the middle of that chart, last column, second to last column from the right. Maximum volume check, yes. So that's the one year storm calculation for each contributing roof area. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I may come back on that question. Thank, thank you for explaining that. Um, sure. Um, the difference in, in some of the wells not covering certain amounts of water, it would seem to me that that means um, some areas of the yard, the water would not be contained small amounts of water would not be contained. Is that correct? Well, I mean, the, dry wells, the dry wells are sized um, up to the one-year storm event. The county will not allow providing more volume than the one-year storm event. So two of the four dry wells um, I'm looking at my calculation, sorry. Two of the four dry wells match exactly to the one year volume. Um, the other two are short by one cubic feet, one cubic foot each. Um, and that's just simply a mechanism of, of sizing a nine by five by 9.5 foot by 9.3 foot by five foot deep gravel structure. Okay. So the accuracy of constructing that, that device and, and trying to gain one additional cubic foot was not a practical consideration. Okay. Um, okay, so... Just, sorry, I'm trying to, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me ask a few more questions. Um, trying to understand the soil testing that was done. Did you do any perk tests? No. To assess? No. no. Why not? The county requires a soil typing investigation. Um, those were the tests that were performed here. And those simply evaluate the uh, classification, evaluate and classify the soil to determine whether or not it's likely to function acceptably uh, uh, in terms of infiltration. Okay. Um, I note on, I guess, uh, Mr. Dillon's email from CAS Engineering on June 13th, uh, see attached soil type report indicating a acceptable soils at S2 location. That, that raised two questions in my mind. What does it mean to be acceptable? And why is the S1 location not mentioned? Um, I think his email was maybe in response to some other questions. I don't have his email in front of me at this moment. Oh, that, that's possible. Um, I it was provided, I think, out of context. It was just provided as an attachment to the package. But both, both soil testing locations uh, confirmed acceptable soil classifications. Thank you. Um, noted that um, I'm looking now at, uh, I guess it's your email from July 20th. We're looking at different options, sort of the response to the town's questions. There's an indication that 
with regards to landscape infiltration, which I would think of as rainscape or rain gardens, uh, you indicate the devices are not suitable for small residential yards. What, why do you say that? Um, so landscape infiltration devices in this particular application are able to treat up to 10,000 square feet of drainage area. Granted, the subject property is, is 8,000 square feet. Um, the design of those facilities would require any upstream water uh, to be diverted around the facility. In other words, they can't be designed to treat neighboring water that enters the property. So mm -hmm. it, has to, it has to be diverted. Mm -hmm. uh, and diverting that is quite challenging on an 8,000 square foot lot as you would have to have drainage swales kind of around wherever you place the, the landscape infiltration facility. Um, and those landscape infiltration facilities have other setback um, limitations similar to those of dry wells, but the fact that dry wells have been uh, proposed and approved, there's no available space on the property for any such landscaping infiltration devices. Okay. Um, I was looking at uh, the permeable driveway and um, I don't know, this, I guess this is a question for town staff and town engineer. Did we independently assess the existing slope of that yard? And I asked because I went there and took some measurements with a, with a, uh, you know, a large level and some blocks so I could level it off and measuring tape. And I believe that that front yard has a slope that varies from two degrees to six degrees. Maybe Deb can answer this in greater detail, but I, I believe that the slope is taken by the uh, the total slope of the driveway from the uh, the survey measurements of the the height at where that where that proposed front of the house is from the uh, curb cut. Okay, well, great point. Um, and I guess be, before we Doug answers, I'd like to go to, to Ron. Um, it's my understanding, Ron, that when it comes to um, these sorts of assessments of the landscaping, we are required to use the landscaping as is, not after the home is constructed. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. Let me read the code language to be certain. Well, the, the code provides all new or replacement driveways must be constructed with permeable materials. This requirement shall not apply to the following, a driveway having a slope of 5% or more. So ultimately the driveway that's constructed can't have a slope of 5% or more. But I think you can reasonably interpret that code provision to require the applicants to address the grade that exists rather than to, let's say, 
modify it so the slope is 6% in order to avoid that requirement. Not saying that's what's done here, but just by way of example. So I, I think a reasonable interpretation would be that you're dealing with this, the pre-construction slope. Mr. President, you're muted. You're muted now. Sorry, thank you. There's some wild cat noises in the background. Had to mute. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Doug, did you have any additional uh, comments on the slope of the yard? Yes, uh, I checked the elevations and the elevation at the base of the garage is uh, 89.9 and the elevation at the property line is 87.8. So there's a 2.1 differential divided by the length of 30.4 feet. That equals a 6.9% slope. And that's from the proposed site plan. Yeah, from the proposed site plan, thank you. Uh, that explains where we get the 7% from. Um, and I had a, another question for, for Ron. Um, I'm trying to understand, um, I guess, the relevance or requirement for waivers. And I've been thinking about this and I thought of a hypothetical where a builder selected a home design that um, when you put it on the lot, it would, I don't know, protrude one foot into a setback somewhere. And it would seem to me that that landscaper, that, that the builder would need to request a waiver to go into the setback. They couldn't just say, well, that's the design we picked. So that's the way it is. It, it, correct. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. The setback so, variance. Right. Yeah. That requires an application and a showing of peculiar conditions of the lot and hardship right. and so on. So, so in a case like this, where, for example, the town code specifies a tiered approach to address stormwater management, and the top tier would be taking steps such as a green roof, then if the builder wishes to build a house without a flat roof, so they can't build a green roof, they would need a waiver to skip that step in the tiered stormwater management. Is that correct. perhaps if, correct? Correct. If the council were to find that reasonable opportunities mm -hmm. do exist up the tier. So this mm -hmm. provision is slightly different than a setback provision, for example. Uh, setback provision mm -hmm. doesn't include consideration of reasonableness. Either mm -hmm. you comply with the setback or you don't. With stormwater drainage, we're required to consider you know, what, what's reasonable going down the tiers. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I do not have any other questions at this time. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Barr. Yes. First of all, I hope you understand that we are very concerned about stormwater mitigation on um, both our current homes, but also on new homes being developed because of the substantial problems with flooding that we have, as you, in fact, heard right at the start of the meeting. Um, with that said, I, I appreciated the very thorough response to our, our comments, but um, I can't say that I, they entirely satisfied me. And I'm, so I'm going to start with one question, which is, you said that the county limits constructions like dry wells to no more than um, storage for a one-year storm event. Um, does the county limit landscaping strategies for mitigation in any similar way? Um, landscaping strategies like rain gardens or, you know, whatever, bioswales or... So um, those are... Those are... Yeah, I mean, the county limits sizing of all ESD devices, right? So dry wells, landscape infiltration, rain gardens, all those, all those devices are limited to the one-year storm event. And you're sure about that? I'm 99% sure, yes. All right. 
Next point is that you mentioned that rain gardens, as was Steve brought up, were unsuitable for um, small residential properties. As you might know, there are at least 15 or 20 rain gardens in Somerset on small residential properties. Um, and they are managing pretty well. Uh, they are not, of course, trying to capture all of the runoff from a roof. Um, they are capturing some portion of the runoff from a roof and are part of the overall mitigation strategy for those homes. Um, Secondly, you mentioned that rain gardens pond. Yes, they do pond indeed, um, but they also clear that water usually within 24 hours, um, which is not problematic for uh, mosquitoes or for anything else. Um, so in fact, they are um, reasonable devices to consider. Um, dry wells have problems too, as you know, and I would not consider approving this without permit without putting conditions on dry wells, uh, particularly that there be a maintenance plan for inspection of the dry wells because they silt up um, and are less effective over time and less cleared. Um, so I'll stop there for just now, thank you. So each of these devices, um, like anything else with a house has to be maintained um the county requires a right of entry agreement for every property that is subject to the stormwater management uh, requirements and part of that agreement um, enables the county to inspect um, these devices at any time yes and but I, sorry to interrupt, but as you know, the county is not really fully staffed to do inspection of all the dry well devices that are installed in homes around the county, right? I would imagine that they would inspect if there's a problem. Identified by someone. Correct. Yeah. I think we need a maintenance plan. Council Member Barr, that is now written into the town code. Whenever a stormwater drainage plan is required, the town has a maintenance agreement requirement that we record in land records, just like the county does. Thank you. Council Barr, do you have any further questions? No further questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Councilor Heller. You're muted. You're, you're muted. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I just had to figure it out. You're Different fine. device tonight I'm on. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. First, this is home. Are you using all of the, the, uh, the allowable amount of the lot that you can build on? Uh... I assume you're referring to under the lot coverage allowance? Yes. No. Do you have a lot of space left over? No. Okay. So you have a little space left over. A little space. Okay. Little space. Thank you. Um, where I'm going with this is in terms of our, our stormwater management and our problems in this neighborhood, and um, one of the things that, that concerns me is that you're not doing a permeable driveway. One of the things that was said in um, somebody's report, I guess it was yours, that it wasn't practical. The word practical was used in terms of, I guess, designing things so you could have uh, a permeable driveway. And in this neighborhood, we need to be good neighbors to one another. And what concerns me is that you're going to have a lot of water coming off this house into not a lot of space, but maybe instead going to the neighbors. And if there's a chance that you can make this a permeable driveway, I think you need to. I don't know if we can make you do that, um, but I think you need to. I think you need to do the right thing by 
the neighbors and 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 and, and this town. That's number one. Um, so that's more of a comment. Yeah, Trevor, Kelly, you might Helen, you might want to ask um, also ask your question to the town attorney. Town attorney, can I ask you that question? We can't make him make them build a permeable driveway, even if it might be the right thing to do. Well, that is a mixed question of, of policy and law. From the legal perspective, the code provides that the driveway is not required to be permeable if the slope is over 5%. And I believe I heard from our building permit administrator, Mr. Lohmeyer, that the slope is 7%. So the code does not require a permeable driveway under these circumstances when the pre-construction grade is steeper than 5%. Sorry, Ron, if, can I cut in, Debbie? Of course. Yes, yes, please like cut in. To clarify, what I heard Doug say is that from the builder's plans for the new construction, the slope is 6.9%. We do not have any official town measurements of the slope. We do not have the existing slope. We do not have any official measurements from anyone on the existing slope. And it, Thank you for that right. clarification. Yeah, I, I misunderstood. Are we able to calculate the pre-construction slope, Mr. Lohmeyer? Uh, uh, the town does not have any ability to do that. It can be requested of the applicant, but we don't have a transit or level or anything else that would measure that slope. Do we have elevation markings on the site plan? Well, that's what I used to calculate the slope, yes. Oh, well, but the site plan shows proposed, not existing topo lines. Well, the, the site plan shows the existing driveway on the right side and proposed on the left. So they're not in the same location. So Mr. Robertson, are you able to calculate the existing slope? Do you have sufficient data to do that? I do. Bear with me. Existing slope is approximately four and a half percent measured from the front of the proposed garage to the property line. The proposed Thank slope, you. as Doug mentioned, is, is 7% based on the design of the house and situating the house at such an elevation that the first floor is not negatively affected by drainage and surface water along with code requirements for separations from first floor to the top of foundation wall. Um, I will say as it pertains to a permeable driveway, the, the state requires that any permeable portion of a driveway be 10 feet from a foundation wall. Um, so we wouldn't be able to make the first 10 feet of the driveway permeable under those criteria. Um, the fact that two dry wells are flanking the driveway, um, Montgomery County will not allow another infiltration device within proximity of their approved ESD devices. So we can't physically make the driveway permeable based on the driveway locations um, and the separation from the garage. And, and even if we could, it would provide treatment for only 20 feet of, of driveway length uh, in a best case scenario. Uh, quick question, um, Mr. Robinson. Yes. You're flipping the driveway. It, it's it's not you're not putting it where it is now. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So, could it be that you could design this 
So it's appropriate for the um, driveway. If that was in your, you know, if you were sitting down to draw your house, maybe you could have done that to do the right thing by our neighborhood and our neighbors. Can I interject here for a moment, please? Sure, uh, it's Peter please. Lustig. Our, our original design um, had the uh, driveway in the same location as the existing driveway. However, when we found out that we were are not allowed to project our front porch um, into uh, BRL, which apparently is a new uh, code uh, that the town has set forth, we had to completely redesign the house. Hmm. And in, in order to get the, uh, you know, the house that we wanted um, to fit on the lot and conform with all with the, with the front BRL as well as the setbacks on the side and the rear yard. So that, that meant we had to put the driveway on the other side of the house for reasons that I can't really explain now, but um, it did have to do with, you know, the overall design of the house, the, you know, the, the, the way the house worked and um, that's why it wound up on the, on the other side of the house. Okay, but my guess is that you guys are smart enough to be able to design this so you could have a permeable driveway. And um, I'm just, that would be my push for you to do well, that. I think that is the right thing to do. Well, the existing uh, driveway slopes at about eight and a half percent. Okay, but you're not doing that one anyway. You've moved over to the other side of the house. I'm just, I'm you, just suggesting that you, if it were, if it were mirrored in the driveway, we're on the other side, it would, it would effectively be steeper. But it's not okay. It's you've moved the driveway, and now all I'm asking you to do, I don't know about the other council members, we're not there yet. Um, I'm asking you to rethink it. That's all. So my next question is your HVAC units. I, I can't really, the plans are too hard for me to see online. And I wanna make sure that these, these HVAC units, wherever you're putting them, um, how, how are they going to affect the neighbors? And so that's my, that's my last question. They're located behind the rear of the house. Okay. All right, none of the neighbors have said anything about this. It's okay with them and well, isn't, Anybody? we're not allowed to put them in the side yard, are we? No. Okay. I just want to make sure the neighbors are being taken care of in this. All right. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Kumar. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the staff and the applicant for their time. I wanted to hear from um, our stormwater expert uh, from Chris. Uh, who I believe is with Poland. And, and Chris, I would, you know, welcome, you know, sort of your assessment of um, your thinking behind the evaluation assessment that you submitted. And you have the letter and you've provided an explanation at the previous meeting, but if you can, for the record, walk us through why you believe in, based on your assessment that this meets the code requirement. And then I have a second uh, related question for either Matt or for Chris, um, which is related to an earlier question from one of the council members. Just an explanation of the phrase in the, you know, the town manager's cover memo on why it is not practicable, practicable to redesign a house and drive it with the slope under 5%, some of which we've covered already, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it, Chris or, or Matt? Sure, Chris, step back and go first. Um, it wasn't more so my, uh, my agreement with the applicant was more centered around the reasons they gave rather than the ability to adjust the slope. The reasons being not being able to uh, construct permeable paver driveway within 10 foot of the house and also the location of the dry wells, which are bordering uh, both sides of the driveway. So that was my reason for agreement in that. Um, I do believe it is possible to, however, you know, costly and uh, sort of um, um, 
going backwards a little bit for the applicant to redesign the site to achieve a 5% slope, but my approval was centered around sort of the um, other supporting reasons that they gave. Thank you, I appreciate that. Could you walk us through your full evaluation and why you felt, uh, why you concluded that they met the town's requirements as per the code? For, for the driveway? For the overall application. Um, they provided sufficient justification for the tiered list of, uh, you know, going practice by practice for treatment of the runoff and stormwater for the site. Uh, so they gave, in my opinion, sufficient justification for the ESD practices that they considered or the non structural practices that were considered for the treatment and why they ultimately selected uh, dry wells for the treatment of the stormwater. I know you didn't con conduct this calculation, but do you have a perspective on whether this is an improvement over stormwater capture from the existing property? Yes, uh, because the current property has zero stormwater treatment, and this property is providing significantly more treatment for the site overall. Okay, and and it, it what is the total sort of number of efforts or interventions this new home will have to mitigate stormwater? The amount of stormwater that is being treated for this uh, home uh is some summed on the second page so they're going to be providing um total of pull this up really fast so is it summed here uh 500 588 excuse me 583 cubic feet of stormwater treatment so storage um, which is, you know, above the zero that the current lot provides. And and the, the number of interventions? Um... The, num the number of treatment facilities they have uh, are four. So they're four separate dry wells. Four separate dry wells. Yes, sir. Um, okay. And Matt, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. And thank you for your time and your You're work welcome. with the town. Uh, Matt, you that you have summarized the sort of cumulative collective view of the town team, and you're recommending. I think we lost Matt. Did we lose him? I don't see him on my end. Uh, let's see. I'll wait for him. I'll give him give him a minute to get back on. I know he had bad connectivity. Oh, he's back. He's back. Oh, he's back, Sam. Matt, can you hear me? He he uh, he got booted. He's reconnecting now. So okay. Hi. Hey, yeah. Matt, did you hear the Sorry. Mr. Town Manager, did you hear the question? You hear me? Matt, your connection is not very good. Okay, uh, let let you know. Um, do you want to try back? Let me see if his phone answers. Let's let's just let's just wait another minute. Sounds good. Did you did you have any other questions for? Uh, I did have a question for for Matt. <laughs> Are you able to hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Good. Matt, uh, quickly. Uh, I'm sorry. You and the town staff recommended um, uh, that the the design, stormwater design, fits the criteria of the code, 
and that this is a proposal is within code. Could you kind of summarize for us for the record uh, your recommendation and the team's recommendation? Yeah, so uh, the the town attorney uh, sort of touched on on this in terms of the way that I was thinking based on conversations with um, our stormwater expert and with our building administrator. But whereas with setback requirements, for example, it's it's very clear it's it's eight feet or it's it's beyond eight feet or it's it, the, the the house can only be 25 feet uh, it needs to be at least 25 feet from the the, the front of the property line um, and that's it with stormwater there's our code requires that a one-year storm event um, be managed based on um, the state's uh, cal uh, state's formula. And it, it, it's a lot of it is based on the, 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 the turn of phrases, the, the best managed practice to the maximum extent practicable. And I think based on the explanations that we received from the applicant, based on the review, um, that, Overall, this project did capture the amount of water that was necessary on site. Um, that it, it's it's hard to say it's impossible to capture more, or it's impossible to not design the driveway to be under five percent, for example. Um, but that, given the constraints of the property, given the constraints that are placed on the structures based on state regulations, et cetera. There's a lot of moving parts in there and that it was uh, at the end of the day that it did capture the water that was required. And um, as as Mr. Stepp said, it's, it's a property that currently doesn't have any storm water management on it. Um, so, that factors in a little bit as well. That um, it's 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 hitting the the criteria of the code. Great, thank you, Matt. No more questions, Jeff. Okay, thank you. So, given the complexity of this application, I I'm going to just run through and see if anybody has any follow up. Council, President Serco, do you have any follow up questions? Yes, I do. thank you, Jeffrey. For Cass Engineering on the volume of water created by a one-year storm event, and I go to page two of your drawing in that table, very useful table. For example, roof A, 636 square feet. When I multiply that by 2.6 inches for one-year storm event and divide by 12 to go from inches to feet, I come out with 137.8 cubic feet that you indicate this table says 131. There's a similar discrepancy for all of the remaining roofs. Can you explain what's happening? I'm probably doing something wrong, but I don't understand. Yeah, the calculation should also be applying a, uh, a runoff volume factor, um, which is uh, ends up being 0.95. So if you multiply your number by 0.95, that's the one year calculation under the state design manual what what does well i guess that was what i was trying to get at in my initial question so there is a 0.95 factor but runoff from what from the roof everything that's on the roof is going to go into the pipes into the drywalls that's 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 just the state's calculation for for determining the one year volume yeah i mean steve think of it this way 5% evaporation something like that okay Okay. I, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Councillor Barr. Do you have any further questions? No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Heller. No, thank you. And Councillor Kumar. Yeah, one uh, follow-up question for Chris. Chris, I forgot to ask you, do you think they could have uh, made any other intervention to mitigate um, the stormwater runoff um, from your expert opinion? 
such as in lieu of the dry wells or to capture the runoff from the uh, driveway? I, 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 I'll leave it up to you. Are there any other interventions do you believe they could have made based on, so to speak, the constraints that the town manager uh, alluded to? In your expert opinion, do you believe any other interventions were possible here? I th I think that the way it's designed it would be how I would have designed this lot. I'm not going to say that they could not have done um, rain guards or something like that, but it would have been a lot of additional um, work to divert, like the applicant's engineer said, a lot of additional work to divert off-site drainage, then you're concentrating flow at additional points on your site. So you're going to have to disperse that flow. You're also sending a new concentrated flow to areas that weren't receiving concentrated flow before. So there's a whole lot of um, factors that you need to consider, you know, not just, you know, treating runoff from our site or stormwater from our site, but how are we going to be affecting the lots that are adjacent to us? How are we going to be handling off-site or upstream, upstream runoff? Um, so, there might been the possibility of doing some additional things or different things, but this is the most logical uh, path to take for development and providing stormwater for this site. And Chris, but, you Chris, uh, got, just sorry, to, oh, sorry, hold on, on. Sorry, about that, that. sorry about that, Robin. Um, Chris, uh, yes, sir. You have uh, uh, when did you first review this in April? Is that right? Uh, let me look at my records real fast i believe so and uh, yeah, if you can, uh, if you, um sorry let me march yeah let me ask my question again sorry about that sorry. could you tell us uh you know how many times have you reviewed this application and and when did you first review it I and mean, when was the last time you reviewed it the last time i looked at it was the just last week when the the had the um response to the council's comments uh, which was more of not reviewing the plan, but reviewing the responses. The first time I reviewed this was back in March. Great. Thank you and so much. It, you're welcome. And okay. there was one other time too. In okay. June, I believe. Thank you. No, I believe yes, that. Sir, Barr, did you have another you. follow up? Yeah, I, I had questions of Chris. Yeah. I, how do dry wells handle um, water discharge from neighboring properties onto the, the lot? Well, they they're below ground, so they're um, they're really the the water that's flowing is well, they, not they don't capture to, it. Not not really, because the water will have to um, percolate Waterfall. through the topsoil layer that is on top of the dry well. Um, so that so it, it potentially will catch some of the runoff, but um, the the water that's coming off your rooftop is much much quicker. Um, going through the pipes is going to going to fill up faster uh, with that. Do, when, your time when, is your time when, of concentration. The second question is when capacity is exceeded, exceeded in dry wells, like uh, when they silt up, for example, and they get much less capacity, where does the water go? The water will be coming over the over, overflow relief. So it'll be discharging to the adjacent grade uh, next to the house. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that rain gardens actually are not doing any worse than dry wells, uh, in fact, in terms of, in fact, probably better than dry wells and handing runoff from neighbor's property. And uh, their capacity can get exceeded in the same way dry well capacity can get exceeded, and then the, the water has to be shuttled elsewhere. That's true. But there's really no difference. There's intricacies of of, of both, um, you know, like it, but you know, dry dry wells are um, the more logical choice for these these types of dense uh, these neighborhoods. Uh, the rain garden is easier to maintain and to uh, you know see if they're if it's functioning correctly. But also rain gardens traditionally that I've seen for. Homeowners, new homeowners move in. They don't like this low area that's ponding in their yard, and they'll they'll fill them in. So um, there has to be vigilance kept in in that regards as well. Um, sure. Is that your final question, Councilor Barr? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
We will now open the floor for public comments. We ask that those making public comments, please be respectful of the council's time and keep all testimony and evidence relevant to the application at hand and not be repetitive. Mr. Town Manager, has any resident or guest indicated they wish to comment at this time? Yeah, it looks like Adam Levitin has joined us uh, tonight. So um, Adam, uh, just make sure to unmute yourself, but uh, if you wanna go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Levitin. I live at 5529 Trent, so just across the street from the, the property in question. And we are um, looking forward to eventually having new neighbors in the property. Um, I did want, there are two issues I wanted to bring up. Um, first, I was very glad to hear that Mr. Lustig has agreed to test and uh, treat appropriately any asbestos found on the property. Um, I was hoping that there might be a similar agreement regarding lead. Um, that, you know, I certainly there are extensive regulations about lead abatement if you are doing renovations, but um, I am not aware of um, regulations that apply if you're doing a total demolition, yet the hazards should be the same. If there's lead, uh, if you're doing a demolition on a pre-1978 building, there's probably going to be lead in the paint. And if you're using a, a wrecking ball, that's going to get in the air. So, um, you know, my my casual research on this uh, indicates that there are some municipalities that um, are require uh, not uh, not in Maryland, but um, but outside of Maryland, there are some municipalities that do have um, some requirements for doing demolition uh, regarding lead for complete demolition. And um, I'm uh, hoping that Mr. Lustig would be willing to consider um, things like um, water application to spray down, uh, spray down the demolition material using a picker method for demolition rather than a wrecking ball, um, having fencing to keep dust from blowing out of the property, and then making sure that the, the trucks that carry away the waste are covered and are not dripping uh, water that would have lead, lead dust in it that would then, when it dries, blow around the neighborhood. Well, so thank you. Like, let's have Mr. Lust respond to that. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's um, it's difficult uh, to to um, to to take a house down in in uh, in such a confined um, situation. Um, generally, we we um, you know we pick we pick it apart with a with an excavator, and and load it into uh, either a truck or a roll off, um, and I think it's important to 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 mitigate the dust created by the uh, by the by the raising um, with you know with water, but but not to the point where we're we're soaking the. Uh, you know the property and um, uh, and have runoff. Um, dust is always is it's 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 unavoidable. Um, we do the best we can to to you know to mitigate that, but um, it's generally a very very fast process. It it's only takes a day, I would say, um, uh, maybe two, and uh, then and then it's over. So um, we do the best we can to to minimize the impact uh, on the neighborhood, but there are, you know, obviously considerations. So, okay, thank you. Do you have any other issues, Mr. Levitin? Yes, the 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 other one was um, there is a large Japanese maple in the middle of the front lawn. It's a beautiful tree. And uh, if my reading of the uh, plans is correct. It's it, uh, it's now slated for removal, and if there's any way that that tree could be saved, and it looks to me that maybe just moving one of the dry wells to uh, a few feet to the right under the existing driveway might do the trick. That would certainly, from the um, from an aesthetic standpoint, do quite a bit to minimize the impact of the construction. Yeah, I agree. I, I like that tree a lot. Um, I, I'm going to have to um, defer to uh, Jeff about uh, the uh, the location of the drywall. Um, I, I would like to save that tree. Um, I always thought it to be, um, you know, 
something that would enhance the, the property. Jeff, is that, is that possible? Um, I mean, there's some grading, there's some grading planned in that area. Um, there's a separation requirement from the dry well to the, to the proposed utilities. Um, right now it's, it's right at the minimum separation requirement from the future sewer connection. So, you know, technically the dry well can't be shifted to the right. Um, that's not to say that Peter, you couldn't make efforts to try and, and retain the tree, you know, during construction as best you can. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. I, I, if, if I, if I may just chime in really quickly on that too, um, because Dr. Feather may want to address that. I think that he he did not recommend protection of that tree in part because of some early decay. signs of decay. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tol Tolbert, you, you might be able to address that question as well. I, be I believe that's uh, tree number six on your report. Uh, yeah, the tree has a, a big cavity at the base that's active. So I don't know, you know, you might go to a lot of trouble to save it and it's might be on its way out anyway. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Levinson. Did you have any other? No, that, that's everything. Thank and you. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. And, and, um, uh, Thank you, Mr. Lustig, for um, being responsive to the request. Before uh, we move on, let me just ask the town attorney to clarify for everybody what the law actually is about lead paint. So at the federal level, Mr. Mayor, and as Mr. Levitin noted, contractors do have to comply with certain removal rules when they're renovating or partially demolishing, but a complete demolition is not subject to the EPA requirements. I cannot state whether there are any DNR requirements. I'd have to research that. That's at the Maryland level. As Mr. Levitin noted, and as we discussed a bit at our last meeting, there are some municipalities like Chevy Chase Village that do require certain testing prior to demolition or lead paint, asbestos, rodents, not required by the county is my understanding. So. Okay, well, thank you. So, so Mr. Levinson, even though uh, it's not a requirement in our town, it does sound like that Mr. Lustig is gonna um, make every effort to limit the impact of the demolition. So, so by coming tonight, it was, it was very helpful in this regard. Okay, thank you. Mr. Town Manager, has any, did anyone else wish to speak? I don't believe there are any other comments at this time. Okay, thank you, everyone. So this concludes the public portion of the hearing. The record is now closed, and the council may now discuss and deliberate the findings of fact and conclusions of law and may take a position on the application. And I will turn it over to our distinguished council president to lead the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you all for joining in on a rainy, stormy night. Um, I want to, to lead off by uh, addressing one of your questions, Debbie, about the size of the house. Um, to the extent that that factors into our considerations of what flexibility there is. Um, from the drawings, the, um, I'm trying to pull this up. There's just so much information here. Um, well, sorry, I, I lost track. So I'll just, I'll skip that. Um, but, but the, 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 the house occupies so much of the, um, the property that the rear porch is not enclosed because it was enclosed, um, then that square footage would, would count against the lot coverage constraints. But because even though it has roof on it, since it's not uh, screened
screened in, it's, it doesn't count against lot coverage. Um, my, my thoughts are, um, I think that, I, I agree that this house would provide more stormwater management than exists with the current house. But that said, I'm frankly, um, personally uh, disappointed that um, the the arc the the team did not uh, consider any of our recommendations. So basically, what we're looking at is the exact same proposal as we looked at a month ago, with explanations for why they couldn't put in a rain garden. They couldn't put in permeable pavers to the driveway. Um, that the house just has to be this house, and I. I don't care for that. Um, it's just my initial thoughts. Let's go around, Robin. Yeah, I was disappointed for the same reason that it's, it has unchanged. It's not changed from the prior application. Uh, it is just justified uh, in other ways, and. You know, in thinking of our code, the idea was to try to introduce different mitigation measures into a similar property. That way you spread the um, benefits and disadvantages across different mitigation measures, which means that it's going to be more sustainable over time than concentrating on only one, which is going to cause problems down the line one way or the other. And this, of course, is concentrating it on one system. Uh, which which bothers me. It is it, it is complying with our code at the same time. I have to say that is true. Um, so it, it leaves me with a little bit of a dilemma there. Um, so I'll leave it at that and get other people's reactions too. I, I, we'll see on permeable driveways. I I wouldn't fuss too much about it. I mean, there's a slope on that land, and even if they can get the driveway down to four percent, it's not really going to capture very much water at four percent. Um, it, it, permeable driveways are not that great at capturing water, frankly, and certainly with a slope, there's just not much value in doing it. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold it up for that. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks for um, Kabir. I think Debbie goes next. And Debbie, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry, Debbie. It's okay. Thanks, Kabir. Um, I find it disappointing. I just feel like it's another big house built to as much as they can put on, on the land with no real um, no real thought to the people around them, behind them, in front of them, their, their neighbors going down the block and the water that's going to rush down. And I, I find this disappointing. And, um, and, and I think they could have made a house maybe a little smaller but they could have made this better to be better for our neighborhood. So I'm kind of, I'm disappointed in it. Okay, Kabir, it's your turn. You know, listening to all of you, I'm thinking it, we may want to do, Steve, another working session and reflection on broadly the stormwater code, but also, you know, reminding everyone we've made truly historic code changes in the last 12 to 18 months. And so I think it's worth reflecting and thinking through whether they're adding up and whether we believe they will add up or we don't believe they'll add up, then they're not gonna achieve the outcomes we want for our town as elected officials, we need to revisit them. Um, you know, so I, I think we, we, need, we need to invest that time perhaps in the fall, in the coming months to do that. I think here two things have happened. One, it, it is in compliance with the code as, as Robin observed. And additionally, I feel quite satisfied by Chris's assessment. He is our in-house expert, um, you know, and he's had time with this application. It's not a rushed thing. That's why I was asking him that question. That it wasn't sort of a rushed thing. He's had time with it. I, I think his answers were compelling for my tastes. And yes, I think I think I can see in the margins potentially more could be done here, but I think we, you know, it gets us in territory that at least I'm technically not comfortable with. And I think we have to, from a procedural perspective, I always prefer to build 
you know, compelling set of reasons based on the expert opinion, which frankly we pay for through taxpayer dollars. Uh, so for all of those reasons, I, you know, I hear all your disappointment, obviously. So all of you are expressing that. I, I, I do think that requires us to go back and at least one of the things we definitely should do is go back and kind of come to some assessment and alignment on whether the code is adding up for what we want. I mean, you know, Debbie, your questions about lot coverage, right? We've come come to that multiple times. I think, okay, maybe that's what we want. Is that what the town wants? Then we should we should go at it and make sure our code reflects that and then revisit the other changes we made, which again, I remind you, were truly are truly unprecedented and historic uh, for our town in terms of how we've tightened, tightened the code. So that's where my thoughts are, Steve. I'm sorry if that's not conclusive enough, but that's where I'm landing. No, that's, that's, that's well said. I think everyone is um, trying to grapple with a number of issues, including as you pointed out, these are new codes and we're learning, receiving feedback from how whether or not we consider those codes to be effective at meeting what we perceive to be the town's needs. Um, I was hoping to hear a little bit more from Robin about why he thinks this meets our code if they're not following the tiered approach. Yeah, well, no, they are following the tiered approach. They, 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 they have um, gone through the level one tier uh, landscaping approaches and say they, they they don't work for them in this environment, and you know I don't entirely agree with their rationale. It's true, but on the other hand, they did it, um, and so that does in fact comply with our code. Um, and so I, I I I'm I think I have to pass it is what it comes down to. But I do absolutely you know. Is we, we do require a maintenance agreement. I want to spell it out on this one that, that we do want a maintenance agreement for the drywalls. It's going to, you know, what I will say is that it needs to be submitted before the permit is cleared by the town and it needs to be reviewed by a building engineer as at, as appropriate. Um, and uh, that is the extra I would add. And, and Steve and Robin, I think there's some truth to Adams, uh, the neighbors, uh, you know, recommendation, and I think Peter, uh, the applicant's observation that it's a tight space. I think if there is a way, I don't know if Ron can advise us that, that when we come down to it, to require, uh, you know, sort of demolition and construction and debris removal procedures that mm -hmm. are submitted, um, you know, uh, at, at the appropriate time for town staff review. I think that the, the construction process itself is very disruptive for the town because we are so close to each other. And we don't really regulate that. We don't regulate the process itself. And I think at some point we, sh we should come back to that because they, it can be a year or two years given some extensions we've given recently. And it, it is an ongoing disruption. Uh, and so I think Adam's observation make me think, at least in this case, we could potentially stipulate some sort of, um, you know, demolition and debris management plan. I'm just making that up. I apologize. I'm not an expert here, but something that, that I think would satisfy the town staff along those lines. So just to add to Robin's list of, potential conditions for approval, yeah. Um, thank you, Kabir. Any, any additional thoughts, Debbie? Um, I have a lot of thoughts. I just, I guess I'm really stymied by this because I don't think this is appropriate. I think it's, uh, you know, when are, when are builders gonna come in and do what's right and that, yeah, you know, Kabir, you, maybe Robin said, or you said, I don't know, that this is a tight space. Yeah, it's a tight space. So make your house smaller. So it's not so tight. You know, make it right. And so I guess I wonder, and maybe this is a question for Ron, even if it meets the code as we've specified, do I have to approve this, this permit? 
Yes, if you find that it meets the code, then the permit has to be granted. So with respect to a, a permit review, it's an up or down question, either it complies or not. You know, with a, a variance, on the other hand, there is some subjective application of criteria. And with the permit, it's, it's purely objective. Does the application comply, yes or no? That said, as previously discussed, there is a reasonableness requirement built into the tiering evaluation. So the council can determine whether the tiers have been reasonably considered. So, so Mr. Town Attorney, could you also advise the council? Uh, you just said it's an up or down if it meets the code, but what, to what extent can they impose conditions on the applicant? Sure, so conditions can be attached to the permit to protect the public health safety and welfare. And with respect to council member Kumar's suggestion, one such condition could be that all demolition shall be conducted in accordance with applicable law with respect to asbestos and lead-based paint containing materials. As the applicant stated tonight, the applicant will have samples taken of the roof and various materials on the inside for asbestos and undertake those remediation efforts suggested by the lab and required by law before demolition commences. So with that council, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Well, first off, I, I think we just, we might agree to disagree. So I read the code as all reasonable opportunities for using non-structural practices must be exhausted before structural practices are implemented. Not just that they've been considered and analyzed. I think, I don't, I, so from my perspective, just to share with us the council, I do not believe that um, the, the constructor here has exhausted all op reasonable opportunities. I also think that with regards to the driveway, which is a separate issue than the stormwater management, our code is explicit that all new replacement driveways must be constructed of permeable materials. The requirements shall not apply to the following a driveway having a slope of five degrees or more. So I think that, I mean, if, if they wish to do it without permeable pavers, that's, that's okay. I think they need to request a waiver. And they have not requested a waiver. And their own engineer indicated that the slope of the soil as is, is four and a half degrees. So those are my last two thoughts. I guess what I'm thinking is maybe, um, Robin, you can put together a, a proposal in favor, but I think I'll be voting against it. Steve, I didn't understand the first part of your comment about um, your reading of the code. That all non-structural methods, such as a rain garden, must be exhausted. And all I've heard is that the space is tight. Maybe they'd have to put a swell in. Maybe that would cost a little more money. Maybe there's not enough space because they have dry wells, but they have all their dry well sizes because of their other space constraints. Um, they, the, the architect, the contractor has um, made a large number of uh, trade-off decisions and, and that's okay. But my interpretation is that those trade-off decisions resulted in um, a failure to exhaust all non-structural options for dealing with stormwater management. Yeah, except, you know, the one thing I would highlight and I, something I try to keep in mind is that the applicant has been responding to our code and the feedback from the town team, including the town's stormwater expert who commented and gave his testimony on how he felt that was addressed. Now we we can revisit whether those procedures were to our satisfaction, but in the lead up to this particular application, you know, it's not only that they just did this in a vacuum, you know, and they've had since April an approval process. And I think our stormwater expert has reviewed them. So I'm just wondering, you know, 
I just don't want it to be in my personal opinion. You know, we've gone through a process and uh, our stormwater expert has given his perspective on it and, you know, concluded uh, that this is the best set of interventions that they could make. And uh, we can, we can this personally disagree, I guess, about it, but I, I'm just, you know, I don't see that my role here. Um, you know, it is to kind of follow the process and follow the code. Right. And so that's um, what I understand where you're coming from. Well, a great, great discussion. Um, and perhaps I heard our, I heard our Bayview consultant a little differently. My takeaway was that- B Bayland, contract, Bayland, right? Bayland, sorry, I said yeah. Bayview, Bayland. Um, that the contractor did a thorough job. They made good calculations. They made some not unreasonable design decisions, but that was all working on the assumption that it has to be this one huge house, for example. Um, I heard the Balin say, um, could, the, could it be done better? Yeah, probably. At least that was my interpretation of it. Could they do the driveway? Yes, they could definitely do a driveway at five degrees or less. These are this is what I heard our our guy say. I mean, if we want a smaller house, then we need a code that leads us to that. We don't have that code right now. Our code does not lead us to smaller homes automatically. Mm -hmm. So I just want to highlight that. That's not. You know, we we and we, we this is now maybe second or third time this has come up. So we we should in a working session, like as I was saying at the start top of my comments, we need to tackle this. Um, you know, because I I think we have a, a one intent that is not fully expressed through where the code is now, despite all the changes we've made, <laughs> and that's what I was trying to highlight. We've made and I've gone along with them with the view that we would see the outcome that would allow us to, you know, constructively and meaningfully move forward in our town with new homes and upgraded homes. And I mean, part of the reason we did the stormwater mitigation efforts and the code update was so that we have stormwater mitigation in the town, right? It's to introduce it at mm -hmm. the level, at the point of new construction, which I think is progress. Um, mm -hmm. But if we, if we are not getting to the outcome we want of smaller homes, how we define them, then I think that's a working session topic to really get to the bottom of that. Just, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not advocating here for smaller homes. I'm advocating for what I believe would be better stormwater management. Yeah. For example, oh, sorry, sorry, if I just, just finish, you have a flat roof. On, on your house, uh, Kabir. You know, we, I've heard another contractor say, flat roofs are not possible. You can't build a house with a flat roof, but you have a house with a flat roof. I think we could have some more houses with flat roofs in Somerset. Have the same square footage, all that, it would just be different designs. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that we can achieve things that we want. I'm saying this is not the moment. <laughs> For that, I'm saying we should figure that out and and find a way to express that in the code. So then we are empowered to enforce mm -hmm. it. Uh, right. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I'm agreeing with right. Kabir. In fact, here what what I'm trying to say on this one is that their design is within our code, and the design, in fact, includes that slight increase in the driveway so they can get up the two steps basically to, to the, 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 that they're putting into the house. That changes the slope from 4.5% to 6%, but it's not a deliberate change in the slope to get around our requirement. It is simply a factor of the design of the house. That I accept. And I also- well, You don't really know that. You don't really know I, that. Well, I, I, I think it's a reasonable assumption in this case. I really do. I don't think okay. it's an attempt to get around our code. But I'll tell you practically that, that the amount of water captured at 4.5% is not very much and not much less than the amount captured at 6%. You, you, you're just not doing very well with a permeable driveway at a slope like that. Um, 
So it, you, there's, we wouldn't gain much by, by, by inputting that requirement in. That's what I'm saying. And I, do, I think it is reasonable that they're doing what they're doing there uh, to, to capture stormwater. Yes, I would have preferred them to have put in a rain garden. I think it's a better mitigation measure because rain gardens, in fact, expand their ability to capture water over time because plants grow. Dry wells do not grow. They, in fact, shrink um, over time. But enough said. I'm ready to make a motion for approval. Go for it. Okay, let me get the necessary document. Um, all right, so I recommend that we approve the uh, construction of a home at 5528 uh, Trent Street and the request for demolition permit, a building permit, a dumpster permit, an HVAC permit, uh, and a driveway apron permit. Uh, now, here come the conditions. Recommend the applicant provide the time with a wall check survey, a building height survey. Um, or also approve, follow the um, arborists uh, requirements for the management of trees and the building engineers um, requirements too. Add to that that we want a maintenance plan for the dry wells uh, submitted prior to final approval of the permit by the town that is has been reviewed by our engineer and add to that Kabir could you put in language that you want on um, management of the construction of the house uh, Ron has the language he mentioned all demolition shall be conducted in accordance with applicable law with respect to asbestos and lead-based paint containing materials applicant will have samples of the roof and various materials on the inside tested for asbestos and take such remediation efforts suggested by the lab and required by law before any demolition commences all right so those are the conditions thank you okay is there second. hold on a second mr town attorney is that motion legally and technically sufficient yes mr mayor Okay, and Councillor Kumar has seconded. Yes, I'm seconding Answer. with, with a strong is... hope that all of us will will approve this because it is, you know, in compliance with with the code and with the process that I've gone through. But again, you know, I am ready to work with all of you to make sure that our code gets to mm -hmm. the point we want it to get to. Okay, is there discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Okay, so it's a tie vote, so it fails for the lack of a what? majority. Well, Mr. And Mayor, not, you vote wait. to break the tie. Yeah, I, I, but, I don't, but I don't have yeah. to vote, so I'm not voting. And we're missing a council member tonight. So thank Jeffrey, you. Jeffrey, you can vote to break, break the tie tonight. But I, but I choose not to. That's so Jeffrey's call. Motion fails for lack of lack of majority. Okay, thank you. The next item to consider approval of the building permit application submitted by Mark and Julie Oxley for the construction of a garage in the rear of the property located at 4515 Dorset Avenue. And we will begin now. Today is August 7th, 2023. This is a hearing before the Town of Somerset Council to consider approval of a building permit application submitted by Mark and Julie Oxley for the construction of a garage in the rear of the property located at 4515 Dorset Avenue. As a reminder to all participants and observers, this hearing is being audio recorded. We ask that all speakers speak one at a time, addressing the council from the podium and by speaking into the microphone and state their name and address for the record before making public comment. The hearing will observe the following order. First, the Somerset Town staff will present their findings and submit for the record a report on the application under consideration. Afterward, the applicant will present the application. Then the Somerset Council will have the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant or staff relevant to the application at hand. Next, other interested parties will have the opportunity to ask questions of the applicant or present comments to the council. Next, the applicant will have the opportunity for rebuttal testimony, after which the public comment period of the hearing shall be completed and the record closed. Finally, the council 
will deliberate and discuss among themselves the merits of the case, the findings of fact and conclusions, and may make a motion on a permit decision. We will now begin this hearing with a presentation of the staff findings and reports, Mr. Town Manager. Yes, and uh, just uh, off uh, right off the bat, uh, I do know that the applicant is was unable to make the meeting tonight. Um, but uh, the applicant submitted a, a permit application for a, a building construction permit to erect an accessory building, uh, specifically a garage in the rear yard of the property. And the proposed garage uh, is going to be is proposed to be constructed on an already existing parking pad. The building administrator reviewed the plans and confirmed that the proposed structure complies with all setback and lot coverage requirements for accessory buildings in the town code. Um, and although the proposed structure is bigger than 150 square feet, the town code provides stormwater management shall be provided for an increase in impervious surface. And because the garage is proposed to be constructed on already existing impervious surface, the stormwater code isn't applicable. And uh, there are no trees that are being proposed for removal, um, but the town arborist has submitted a tree protection report for a couple of trees that are right near the property line. Um, and I think that concludes my section, I don't know if Doug or Tolbert have anything to add for the uh, staff report. Uh, this is Doug, I have nothing to add. Uh, no, I'm, I'm um, I, there's a tree protection plan that's in the packet. Okay, so thank you. So the applicant is in here, I assume from the staff uh, that they were fine with your uh, recommendation. Yes, so, uh, I, based on based on the fact that it complies with the town code, I recommend approval of the permit application. Okay, excellent. Uh, Council President Circo, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. It seems straightforward. Thank you, Councilor Barr. No questions. Thank you, Councilor Rahela. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kumar. Questions for me, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Town Attorney, has any resident or guest indicated they wish to speak? I think that was for me, but, but no, no, no comments. Okay, thank you. So I think in this case, I think you're prepared to make a motion. Yes. I move that the Council approve a building permit application submitted by Mark and Julie Oxley for the construction of the garage in the rear of the property located at 4515 Dorset Avenue. Second. Is there a discussion? I should have asked uh, the town attorney if that was legally and technically sufficient. Yes, it is, Mr. Mayor. I heard a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, thank you. Next item. To consider approval of the following town tree, removal of the following town trees. Uh, a red oak at 4721 Essex Avenue, a pin oak at 4921 Essex Avenue, a sugar maple at 4801 Essex Avenue, and a pin oak at 5803 Warwick Place. I will turn it over to our distinguished town arborist. Uh, two of the trees are dead, and uh, the uh, sugar maple and the pin oak. And uh, 4121 Essex is um, a red oak that uh, has um, badly scorched. It's losing lots of wood, and uh, it's hazardous. And 4921 is a pin oak that lost a couple of large branches during the past storm. and. Um, probably needs to come down at this point because it's hazardous. Okay, thank you. Council President Sirico, do you have any questions? Oops, no questions, thank you very much. You, Councilor Barr. Uh, sort of more general question, Tolbert. We've had a number of trees come down, obviously, um, in the storm and even without a storm. 
do you have all the equipment that you need or are there any other tools you want that would be able that would help you evaluate the health of trees going forward that's what it was down to can we get you anything else um i there's uh, the most of our evaluations are visual looking for outward signs of decay or what would make a tree hazardous mm -hmm. um so i i mean there's no i use a mallet sometimes or a hammer to see if the tree's hollow so there's nothing specific you know that would help the process all right all right thanks thank you council member heller do you have any questions I don't, thank you. Councilor Kumar. Well, but uh, you know what I'm going to ask. Go, for, you... it, go for it. <laughs> I, I, can, I can jump in and answer that one because I know Linda. No, and no, I, I, I want to hear, I want to oh, hear Tober. Okay, all right. All I want right. to hear Tober. Wait a minute, I'll... ask the question for the benefit of. <laughs> or I don't know, what is this, eight months and running, asking the same question? Ask, please ask it. Please ask Have it. you checked with residents whose properties are abutting these trees or these trees are adjacent? Oh, oh the one there in front. Uh, actually, the 49, 47, 21, and 49, 21 were requests by the residents to look at them. And the other two are dead. Um, so um, I didn't specifically knock on doors or anything there, but um, the other two have requested to have the trees examined. So, but thank you for that. I mean, this does remind me, which is the other thing I've been asking for for a year, which is, and the recent sort of downing of trees also reminded me of that, which is how are we really accounting for our trees, the database that you've been working on now for a year, I think it would be good to, action that sooner rather than later because my understanding is that's the foundation of how we manage and maintain these streets in our town um so you know i don't want to put you on the spot but it'd be good to come back to this at a later time but we do need why don't you to let get that the, squared away why don't you let the arbors uh answer that good question and then the town manager wants to answer something too okay yeah, I've been um, evaluating software. I got held up on that because of the death of my mother, believe it or not, just because I've never had time to really. I've been going back and forth to Albuquerque for the past, what, eight months. Um, that's going to end uh, this month. So I can spend more time on that and and start actually working on it. But the 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 software it, surprisingly to me the software is is not that good the ones that are available and they all have drawbacks they're not what you know what I would like to use so you kind of have to use what's there uh, I was encouraged yesterday apparently Oregon State has contracted with uh, Planet Geo um and using their software <clears throat> and the state actually provides that to municipalities to use free of charge so that kind of gives that's the one i've been looking at lately and that's actually gave me some encouragement that they would commit to that um so that's probably the one i'm going to go with i've actually had trials and just haven't had time to to spend time on it and they've given me some leeway on that too um so um in, in the, the end of august and september i should have something up and running okay i appreciate that of course my and, deepest and then and i think the town manager wanted to respond oh i was just going to clarify and also say that when the the arborist submitted the trees for his recommendation of removal that Linda put together a notification that was sent to all of the uh, properties there as well. Perfect. Thank you, Linda. But, but also, Councilor Kumar, and this is an issue that 
was raised several years ago by a resident in Essex that we do need to look at our code in terms of the, what the notice requirements are for trees. Because all, all the, that the staff is doing is just on their own, you know, they decided to do it. But, but I do think that we need to look at, the, at what the requirements are so that down the line that will be followed in an organized way. So, so we've, we will be putting that on a future work session um, topic. And Matt the, the, the other thing I'm doing, it's not in a code, or, but Matt and I talked about is I actually post the trees that they're going to be removed and the reason why. Right. So, and I, yeah. Right. And all that, but all that should probably be in, spelled out either in code or regulation. So I'm glad that Councilmember Umar keeps bringing it up because I thought we should do that for years. So thank you. Uh, and now the hearing portion, I see that a resident has a comment. Mr. Canna. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, it, it relates not necessarily to tree removal, but I think uh, uh, Matt is aware that at 5526 Uppingham, there is a very large limb that is hanging precariously from the, from the previous storm. And I think, uh, I think the, the, the town office has been notified of it. And we're quite concerned that this tree limb might fall at any time. And I don't know if it fell today with the wind, but anyway, it's sort of dangling in the canopy um, and it would be great to know what the plans are to, to take care of that. Thank you. I, 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 can, I, can, I can speak to that. Um, I, I asked uh, our contractor to take the limb out and they came and it's resting on a wire, a, a Pepco wire. So I have notified Pepco that the limb needs to be removed by them. And I'll reach out to them again. That was a couple of days ago. I'll reach out again and make sure it gets done. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Town Manager, did anybody else indicate they wanted to speak about on this topic? No, no other public comments at this time. Okay, thank you, Council. Are you prepared to make a motion? Councilor Kumar, you're Mr. Tree. I can uh, motion to approve removal of the following town trees um, as listed in the town agenda, the council agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. I heard Barr first. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. The next item is the building administrator's report, Mr. Lohmeyer. At 4515 Cumberland, the property owner submitted a building from application to the county and to the town. And as we discussed last month, the resubdivision plat for that property is being reviewed by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So that project is on hold right now. Uh, at 4900 Cumberland Avenue, that permit expires on August 15th. It appears that the work will be completed by that date or within a couple of days afterwards. So we're keeping an eye on that one. At 4816 Essex, uh, the town, they're making some additions to the existing house. The permit was issued on May 6th and work is underway. 4800 Grantham, they're also making additions to the house. That town permit was issued on July 8th. And at 5529 Surrey Street, uh, that house has been sold. The owner plans on tearing it down and building a new house. But they haven't submitted anything to the town or the county yet. At 5522 Uppingham, the council extended that building permit until December 31st. And at 5613 uh, Warwick Place, that construction is ongoing. The applicant has submitted a revised application to construct a deck at the rear of the house. We've provided them with comments and waiting to hear back. And that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Council President Serco, do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Barr. No questions. Thank you, Councilman Heller. No questions. Thank you, Councilman Kumar. 
None for me. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next item, public hearing motion to consider the adoption of a resolution establishing a social media policy. Mr. Town Manager. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, we discussed this, I think, at the work session um, with the new website going live. Um, our deputy town manager has also been working on establishing social media platforms for the town. Um, so with those launching, um, we wanted to ensure that there was a um, safe and productive way to um to be able to monitor those platforms and so uh, he's worked with the town attorney using montgomery county's social media policy as um, a guide and created the following policy for us and so once this is approved then we will um, also go back to the state and amend our document retention policy as well so that's kind of step two of this process for us. But tonight, it's just a resolution adopting the policy that allows us to uh, monitor the website as it says in the policy. Thank you. And does the deputy town manager wish to add anything? I think Matt covered it pretty much. Thank you. This is a this is a historic moment. Our Deputy's first major initiative. Thank you. Council President Serco, do you have any questions? No questions. I'm excited about this. Thank you. Councilor Barr. Just one question, which is that is there any plan for any moderation on any of the social media channels? In other words, is there somebody reviewing the comments before they're posted? Uh, I can answer that. So uh, currently, the comments will not, cannot be reviewed. Uh, until they're posted, but after they're posted, that's when the social media policy kicks in and we can examine them and make sure they fit within that policy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hella. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kumar. You know, I'm, I'm very happy that we're doing this, but I have to say the policy doesn't say anything about what is permitted or not permitted. Because part of these policies on social media is, you know, to effectively have some guardrails around what gets communicated because people tend, there have been incidents of folks, you know, I don't know if you say tweeting anymore since the name has changed, but, um, you know, there have been XXing, I guess. Um, but why don't you so let them stop it? Let yeah, I, I'm respond. wondering. I mean, I'm I'm fine. Let's move forward, but just wanted to highlight that well, it doesn't well, really I, establish a, any guardrails. It's, a, it's right a very good question. Remember, we want to just get a baseline, a, you know, a base policy, and then when issues come up, it can be amended. But let's let the staff answer your question. Your very good question. Are you are you referring to the resolution itself or the policy? Uh, I, I I only have one document. If you so, look on page ninety-two, sorry, Matt, go ahead. Ninety-two no, no. PDF. The 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 and um, my apologies if it if it came if it's either hard to read or if I had uh, uploaded it incorrectly. But page one and two is a generic res that uses generic kind of resolution language. And then page three and four is more descriptive um, policy on the types of comments that will and will not be um, accepted. And there's seven examples of no-nos. So that the policy provides that the town will delete comments that are off topic or disruptive advertisements or political endorsements those that infringe on copyrights and other intellectual property, those are those that are repetitive, those that contain personally identifiable information, those that use profanity, are discriminatory, defamatory, hateful, violent, pornographic, or otherwise obscene, or speech that is otherwise unprotected by the First Amendment and deemed inappropriate. 
I, I, I was the fool on this one. I only read the resolution, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I'll, I'll, um, I appreciate don't, it. Don't the criticize only, yourself. The only thought that comes to my mind is on images. But as, as Jeffrey said, we can establish this baseline and we can update that at a, at a subsequent date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I see that our public safety chair has a comment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm still a little bit unclear as to how this will work. Will someone be monitoring this on a daily basis, or does the town use filtering technology to screen out any obscene or hateful or disruptive comments? And also, the second question is, what do you do if that person's off for the weekend, they don't notice something that's posted. In the meantime, it gets retweeted or shared or whatever. How are you going to screen these? Thank you. So I can answer that one. Um, okay. So I would, part of my duties as deputy time manager will be responsible for these pages. I will, I get notified anytime action is used uh whether it's a comment or just a simple like and on my cell phone so i can interact i can check to make sure it's uh meets the social media policy in the moment so mr chair the deputy town manager is on the line so you have his contact info okay thank you Okay. Who's anybody else who wanted to speak, Mr. Town Manager? Uh, I don't believe there are any other public comments at this time. Okay. Thank you, Council. You're prepared to make a motion. I can. Motion to adopt a resolution establishing uh, the aforementioned social media policy. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. I heard Circa first. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those Aye. Thank you. The next Thank item, you, Ike and, and Ron. The next item is to consider the adoption of a resolution establishing an invasive plant list. Mr. Town Manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this was introduced uh, last month, um, and then at our subsequent council work session we had discussed what tiers and what plants specifically to put on this list the council had requested that the pnrc take a look at it um they weren't able to formally meet um, between people being out of town um but they uh well at least the chair had emailed me we, we had had some um, communication back and forth and it endorsed approving the tier one and tier two list at this time and the pnrc is planning at their next scheduled meeting to take up this topic and discuss if there are any other uh if there are any other on the uh there was a third tier list um as well if there are any that we want to pull from there and add to uh, an updated resolution and i'll just note that the way that the um the way that this is written right now is if it, it it's it references the uh the Maryland Department of Agriculture's list so if and when a, a new species is added to that tier 1 or tier 2 list it would automatically be uh rolled into the town's policy thank you council president Serco, do you have any questions no questions. I'm excited on this too. We're moving ahead in the area. Councilor Barr. Yeah, I'm going to approve this policy. I will add, I went to the Maryland Department of Agricultural site and they took, they actually list something else, uh, which is called the Plant Invaders of Mid Atlantic Natural Areas Field Guide at that site. And the reason why they do that is that they have a the tier one and tier two, a rather constrained list. Um, and, and there's a much broader category of invaders beyond tier one and tier two. Um, this field guide lists them all. It is, con it is updated regularly. There's one update in 2022. 
So at some point, we might want to look at that guide uh, as a council or get PNRC's advice on that guide um, to extend the list um, beyond what is on tier one and tier two. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Heller, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kumar. Uh, none, just, uh, just thanks for um, uh, moving forward on this. Thank you. I see the public safety chair has a comment or question. Yes, thank you. I'm going to try to make this two for two. Um, my com well, my suggestion is the, that you go further and require only native plant species uh, for new construction. Uh, I don't know if you saw the email that uh, Sarah Morris sent out recently that native or non-native plants attract different kinds of new mosquitoes to the area. Uh, so there are a lot of consequences to using uh, non-native plants, even if they're not invasive. Uh, so maybe it's something that the PNRC would need to take up later, but that's just my recommendation. Thanks. Okay, thank just you. Just for plants, not for people, right, Mr. Westman? Non-native, just on the plant okay. front. Um, <laughs> I you think that's probably correct. Be correct. <laughs> if you're going to do it, we have to re rephrase these things. It's all right, so I'm not an native either. Better. Unless you're a non-native. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ten did, did anybody else wish to speak, Mr. Town Manager? Well, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I would just quickly add that this item yes. is only necessary assuming you adopt the ordinance which follows on the agenda. And I'm assuming you're going to adopt that ordinance. Thank you. Don't, don't assume anything in a democracy. Council, are you prepared to make a motion? I can make a motion. Motion <laughs> to consider adoption of resolution establishing an invasive plant list as provided by the town staff. Is there a second? Second. I heard Barr first. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, thank you. And next is a public hearing motion to consider the adoption of an ordinance banning invasive plant species during new construction is recommended by the Town Environment Committee. Mr. Town Manager. Yeah, I just in response to Mr. Veswani's comments previously, that, that might be that would maybe be addressed in this currently um uh 112 the way that it's written is section 11260 uh i'm sorry 11214b says a planting plan must be submitted for new construction the planting plan must not include in any invasive species um, so that that's where that invasive species list came from. Um, this was introduced last month and is now um, up for adoption. And this just as a reminder as well, I'm sorry, uh, just one one more quick point that this recommendation came from the uh, Environment Committee. Okay, thank you, Council. Sure, thank you. Sir, if you have any questions. No, I, I'm really glad to see our committees putting these recommendations forward to us. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Yeah, I, I would like to specify a little bit better. Um, so we make it non-native invasive plant species in the resolution um, and in the motion, um, because that's that's really what we're aiming at. Um, there are native invasive plants. I've got some in my yard. Goldenrod is one of those. Um, it is a native plant, though. So we're not banning goldenrod. Um, we're banning not non-native invasive plants. Okay, thank you, Councillor Heller. Nope, no questions, thank you. Councillor Kumar. I agree with uh, Robin, uh, invasive is the universal set, however, Robin. Um, I, I just have one question for Matt. Will this now be part of Tolbert's checklist for new construction? Uh, yes, I mean, it, well, it, it will, yes. Short answer is yes. We, we we will include it as part of the requirements for the application. So when an application is submitted, and then Tolbert will review it. So then we will be prepped to ask 
those questions. Um, exactly. I mean, the, yeah. the way that I'm envisioning it right now is a, a breakdown of a list of plans to be proposed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Town Manager, has any resident or guest indicated they wish to speak on this topic? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. So now, given that uh, Councilor Barr uh, is interested in amending what was presented, I'm going to turn it over to the Council President to lead the discussion of the, in the final decision. And I'll turn it over to, to Robin to provide some of his insights. Okay, I mean, it, it is just what I said, which is all, all we need to do is put non-native and funded invasive. Um, that's the only change I'm recommending. And it further specifies what we're not allowing. Um, and it goes back to, again, the, the, what we just discussed, the tier one and tier two um, invasive plants, which are indeed non-native plants in there. Um, and they have, uh, in fact, allowed a, a native species of bamboo, if you read further into that document. So they do actually distinguish between non-native and native in, in the Department so, of Agriculture. So why don't you, why don't you make a move? But it seems like everybody, why don't you just make a motion? Okay, uh, move to adopt the resolution. Let me get it on the agenda. Um, all right. Um, so consider the adoption of an ordinance banning non-native inv invasive plant species during new construction as recommended by the Town Environment Committee. That's it. Okay. Second. But I thought you assuming I, Ron is okay with it. But I thought you wanted to it's already the language. It's already in there, actually. So invasive species is defined as non-native organisms set forth on the list of invasive species adopted by resolution of the town council. It's the universal word, Robin. That's okay. What I'm all right, then I I won't fuss over it then. All right, I'll stop. Okay. So, so Councilor make your Barr, motion again. Make your motion again. So, Councilor Barr, you are just moving what had been presented. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's just I'll make it clear here to consider the adoption of an order banning invasive plant species, and that means a non-native invasive plant species during new construction, as recommended by the Town Environment Committee. So that will all be. That will yeah, we could place non-native in the title of the ordinance to make that clear. No, on the that would be good. That's it. That would that's be good. It. Okay. So that's. A friendly amendment that's been accepted and the right. and attorney mm -hmm. understands that. Okay. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And our last item tonight is the manager's report. Is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, report. just I I I would I am I do want to be mindful of everybody's time, so I I I have the report there, so I I won't go over it. Um, the only thing that I I wanted to make a note on is the street right, excuse me, street light replacement. Um, the timeline that I said after I had written this and submitted this, I I got an email from Pepco clarifying that that's not necessarily how it works um that the eight <laughs> weeks don't don't kick in until we actually pay the bill so um i i was maybe being a little overzealous on uh how quickly we might get this in but that being said they are aware that there there is a time crunch given that we are planning to use the arpa funds for it so um so there there is there's a reason for them to um, want to expedite the process as well. But otherwise, uh, I'll let the report stand okay. for themselves and anybody has any questions. Councilor President Sirka, do you have any questions? No question. Councilor Barr. Yeah, uh, you were getting, you quote, a fast charger for the for the electric truck for the town hall. Uh, do you mean a level two charger? That's like an overnight charger um, for, for it. Is that what you're looking for? um that's a good question i don't i don't know exactly what the i can i can send i can send it, you it, exactly it's probably a level two charger in which case you're all right uh, the, the the issue is that if you go with a faster charger um it can um shorten the battery life if you regularly use a fast charger 
Um, but at a level two charger, you're not going to do that. So a level oh, two okay. charger. Right All charge. right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you and maybe get your, get your feedback on what I was looking at just to make sure that we All right. are being thoughtful. About All right. It. Thank you. And we're making progress on the, uh, you know, the people who haven't responded on, on the, uh, uh, stormwater mitigation project, uh, you know, at the corner of Dorset and, and Essex, right? Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for uh, reminding me of that. Yes. I think there's, there's one more house that uh, I think we're, we're feeling pretty optimistic about. They, they just, I think in summer have been difficult to track down, but um, one almost, more house that was kind of critical to the the plan. So. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Rahela, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Akuma. And for me. Thanks, Matt, for all the work. Okay, thank you, everyone. Under trying circumstances, I'm glad there was no hurricane tonight. And we will see you in person on August 21st at 5:30. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. for your flexibility, everybody. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, you, everyone. Great it was a good call, Matt. Thanks for coordinating it. Great meeting. Right. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.